Hello and welcome to the week 12 lecture, part one of uh, revenue and expense recognition. Uh, over this and part two of the lecture, I'm going to cover uh, background uh, on the project uh, that led to uh, one document so far, the 2018 invitation to comment that was issued for uh, public response, and then uh, the document that, that the GASB is working on uh, that it intends to uh, consider for issuance in June of 2020, a preliminary views, uh, and the content of that uh, we will uh, cover in the second part of the lecture. So starting with the background, um, <clears throat> this project is intended to establish a comprehensive model that can be used for all kinds of revenue and expense uh, recognition issues for all kinds of transactions to determine whether uh, revenues and expenses or expenditures should be recognized. Um, right now, uh, there is nothing like that in the GASB standards or anyone else's standards for that matter. So the goal here is to uh, create one broad set of, uh, of guidelines, of guidance, uh, that uh, uh, is based on uh, principles uh, related to how you identify uh, a transaction, how you determine uh, recognition rules for it, uh, and how you place an amount on that uh, transaction and those financial statement elements when they're recognized in the financial statements. Uh, to do that, we need to fill in a lot of gaps in the current literature, particularly with respect to expenses uh, that are exchange transactions, very basic things like uh, salary expense. There's no place you can look in our standards or, for that matter, FASB's, uh, where it says this is how you recognize salary expense. It's just one of those things that uh, is commonly understood in practice. And, uh, you know, you see it in the textbooks, but there isn't actually anything in the existing current standards specifically addresses those types of common transactions. There are some things in practice in the existing standards that GASB has, such as the non-exchange uh, transaction standards that have uh, proven to be challenging uh, or perhaps not as good as they could be. And this model would be uh, geared towards solving those problems as well. Um, the board also committed in this project to at least give consideration to the performance obligation approach taken by the FASB. Uh, and then to you know, review this model and to develop it in the context of the GASB's conceptual framework. Uh, because the, the standards that we have right now for revenue and expense and expenditure recognition uh, was established before the board had issued its standards, uh, its concept statements on communication methods, uh, recognition, uh, measurement, um, uh, uh, elements of financial statements. None of that was around at the time. And so, uh, as with other standards that uh, the board has re-examined in recent years, uh, these standards need to be uh, ex examined in the context of those definitions of inflows and outflows of resources and assets and liabilities and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, right now, uh, GASB has, uh, there are four documents where you're going to find the lion's share of the general revenue and expense slash expenditure uh, recognition standards uh, for non-exchange transactions. It's statement 33 as amended by statement 36. And then what little exchange transaction guidance there is, uh, is found in statements 34 and 62. And I can tell you that it more or less boils down to recognize revenues and expense when incurred. Uh, and uh, that's not particularly helpful. Um, a lot of transactions are just not straightforward enough uh, for that very shallow and, uh, and abrupt guidance to be uh, applicable. 
the existing standards are predicated on this notion of distinguishing between exchange and non-exchange transactions, uh, with an exchange transaction being uh, essentially a transfer of equal value between two or more willing parties, and a non-exchange transaction uh, involving a government giving value but not receiving equal value in return, or any value at all in a lot of cases, uh, or uh, receiving value from another party without giving equal value, or in some cases, any value at all in exchange. And in some cases, uh, there is uh, an unwillingness uh, on the part of uh, one or more of the parties to the transaction. Uh, for instance, sometimes lower levels of government are required to do things that higher levels of government make them do, and they may give them some money to do it, uh, and, the, and the lower level of government has no choice. Taxes uh, generally are not paid willingly. Uh, I think you may not uh, fight it, uh, but I don't think most people would pay taxes if they didn't have to. Somewhere in between those two polar opposites of the exchange and the non-exchange is a transaction type called exchange-like, uh, because you can imagine that there's a vast difference between the ultimate non-exchange transaction where the government gives or receives and nothing flows in the other direction, uh, and the exchange transaction where the values that are being exchanged are equal. What if uh, the, the government uh, provides something that equals X of value and uh, receives half of X in return? Is that exchange or non-exchange? And this is one of the areas that where the existing standards really fall apart uh, because there isn't any substantial guidance uh, to guide governments in terms of dealing with those types of transactions. Uh, and frankly, exchange-like is only defined in a footnote that appears in a few statements. It's in 33, it's in 34, it may be in a couple of other places as well. Um, anytime the issue of exchange comes up or an exchange transaction in a pronouncement, uh, we tend to replicate this trend, th this footnote that says, uh, you know, exchange like is a matter of degree. Uh, and, and, but without saying what that matter of degree is, is it, you know, uh, is 50% the, the, the demarcation point? And if it's less than 50%, it's non-exchange and more than 50% it's exchange, there's absolutely no guidance at all. Uh, and as uh, we will discuss later, that's a source of some inconsistency uh, and variation in practice. In terms of exchange transaction guidance, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's some guidance in 62, uh, some guidance very briefly in 34. Uh, 34 is where it says, uh, uh, you should recognize uh, revenues and expenses uh, when, when the exchange takes place. Um, Statement 62, which isn't Gasby's guidance, it was brought in from uh, uh, very old uh, guidance uh, of the FASB, um, which, you know, frankly, I don't think they established either. I think they received it probably uh, uh, from uh, the Accounting Standards Board, uh, the um, you know, before them, and, and, and so this guidance uh, isn't particularly helpful either. Uh, you know, when an exchange is affected, uh, that's when, uh, uh, you know, that's when you should be recognizing uh, revenue from an exchange. Um, but, you know, it doesn't say anything about expenses. So there's really no exchange transaction expense guidance at all in our standards or FASBs for that matter. On the non-exchange side, uh, most of this comes from Statement 33 with some amendments in Statement 36. Uh, statement 33, as you know, identifies four types of non-exchange transactions. Two of them are revenue only. That's uh, imposed non-exchange revenues and derived tax revenues. And the other two have both a revenue and an expense or expenditure side uh, because they're essentially grants mandatory exchange, non-exchange transactions, voluntary non-exchange transactions. Um, a government may be a, either a provider and or a recipient 
uh, of grant money. So impose non-exchange revenues, and I'm not going to go through these in detail because that's not the point uh, of this uh, part of the course, but enough so that you can understand uh, what's required now uh, if you need a refresher, uh, and, and then to understand why some of this guidance is problematic. For imposed non-exchange revenues, basically you're talking about property taxes here, but also uh, fines as well, uh, traffic tickets, uh, moving violations, uh, um, you know, building code violations all would fit in here, but mostly you're thinking about property taxes. And the, the requirement for property taxes is that you recognize an asset uh, uh, when cash is received or when the government has an enforceable legal claim, uh, whichever comes first. Generally, it has that when it establishes its property tax levy. Um, and then you recognize revenue at the same time uh, as the asset. And then there is this, you know, twist as, as we discussed when we did the section on, on deferrals, uh, you know, where if the if the property taxes are levied uh, before the period for which they were levied, then you're going to recognize a deferral until you reach that period. All other taxes are considered to be derived tax revenues, and these are taxes on exchange transactions that are taking place out in the economy. You know, somebody works for a company, they earn income, that income is taxed, uh, the income tax. Uh, they buy something, they buy a car, and a sales tax is applied to the purchase price of the car. Uh, that's why it's called a derived tax revenue. Uh, these are recognized uh, uh, when cash is received uh, or when the underlying exchange occurs, whichever comes first, but most of the time, the government may not know that the uh, underlying exchange has occurred until it actually receives the cash. That's uh, you know, often the case, with uh, uh, particularly with retail sales. Um, but depending upon what types of reporting systems they have, in particular with income, where uh, there may be some regular electronic reporting of, uh, of income information, uh, they may in fact know before they get their uh, income tax payments uh, that income has been earned, but generally they're going to be recognizing that revenue uh, or recognizing and or recognizing uh, an asset uh, at the time when the cash is actually received rather than uh, hearing about it and recognizing a receivable first. Uh, for uh, government mandated non-exchange transactions, which tend to be uh, the category where you find expenditure-driven grants, where the government spends money on an acceptable purpose uh, under some grant program and then files for reimbursement, and the grantor, usually the federal government or the state government, uh, cuts them a check uh, equal to the amount of the allowable uh, expenditures. Uh, voluntary non-exchange transactions, uh, to the extent that there is still unrestricted aid, that is considered a voluntary non-exchange transaction. Some contractual agreements uh, that uh, governments may enter into, which you uh, tend to see more in colleges and universities uh, and hospitals, uh, where they may be entering into an agreement to uh, conduct uh, research for uh, you know a particular purpose. Uh, you know that those often show up as voluntary non-exchange transactions as well. Without going into this in too much detail, one of the key things to note here is that there is some intended symmetry here between the provider and the recipient. The, the provider recognizes a payable, the recipient should be recognizing a receivable and vice versa. Um, and when they're, one is recognizing expense or expenditure, the other one should be recognizing revenue. Um, the, you know, one of the issues here is, you know, if, if it's an expenditure-driven grant, and, and the recipient government spends first, and at that point, it's entitled to receive grant payment, then at that point, it's going to recognize uh, its revenue and a receivable. Um, the only time there's a twist is when cash is provided in advance uh, before um, the eligibility requirements have been met. Uh, and in that case, uh, the, the recipient recognizes a liability until it meets those requirements. Uh, and uh, uh, in instances where cash is provided in advance and 
the eligibility requirements have been met or there aren't any eligibility requirements. And the only thing that put, is limiting in terms of that, you know, how that money can be used is a, a, a time aspect, uh, saying that they, money can't be used until next year, for instance. Those are the instances in which a deferred inflow of resources is recognized by the recipient and a deferred outflow of resources by the provider of the resources until uh, you reach the, the, that next year when they're allowed to use the money. And at that point, the recipient recognizes revenue and gets rid of the deferral. The provider recognizes expense or expenditure and gets rid of the deferred outflow. In addition to the research that GASB was conducting internally uh, on its existing standards, uh, there were a couple of other external events that uh, contributed to the project uh, and uh, moved it forward. One was uh, that the Financial Accounting Foundation conducted a post-implementation review of Statements 34 and 36, basically finding that it was working as intended, uh, that it uh, resolved the issues that it was intended to fix, um, that the information that was resulting from it was useful uh, to the users of financial statements for making decisions and assessing accountability, uh, and that it was what they call operational, uh, meaning that uh, it functions properly, that uh, governments can apply it as expected. Um, they did identify some uh, challenges with applying the standards, uh, most notably uh, governments uh, having difficulty in some cases determining whether a transaction was exchange or non-exchange, largely for the reasons already talked about uh, in this lecture, uh, as well as some issues with identifying uh, and distinguishing between a property tax lien and a levy date and, and the point at which uh, a government has an enforceable legal claim uh, to uh, the property tax revenue, which is important because that's the point at which they recognize a receivable and a uh, and property tax revenue. The other thing, uh, a minor uh, a, you know, a, occurrence in the accounting world was, uh, was FASB's issuance of uh, ASU 2014-9, Revenue from Contracts with Customers. Uh, so the culmination of a joint project between FASB and the IASB uh, resulted in a very, very significant change in how revenue is accounted for uh, by entities that follow FASB standards. And most notably, uh, and I'm not going to go into this in any detail because it's really beyond the scope of this course, but uh, they introduced this performance obligation notion uh, and, uh, and, a, and based revenue recognition on uh, the satisfaction of performance obligations uh, in uh, contracts between uh, an entity and its customers. And they laid out a five-step process in which you identify the, you know, the contracts that you have with your customers, you find the performance obligation or obligations within that contract, um, determine the transaction price, allocate that transaction price uh, to the obligations, the performance obligations, if there's more than one, if there's only one, no allocation is necessary, and then you recognize revenue when or as over time the entity satisfies those performance obligations. Uh, the board felt that, at the very least, it should examine uh, what the what the FASB had done and consider whether it was something that could be applicable to governments without committing to saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, uh, because obviously the FASB wasn't examining uh, these standards in the context of how they might apply to state and local governments. And so some uh, evaluation was necessary to determine whether that would in fact be uh, practical or not, whether it's something that would function uh, in the governmental environment. Uh, and that, you know, brought the GASB to uh, the point at which it decided to add uh, a project to its current technical agenda on revenue and expense recognition uh, with the objective that I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, and, and so, you know, FASB took on revenue and that project took years, uh, and they didn't take on expense at that time. Um, 
the board felt that if it was going to do this and do it right, it needed to take on both at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and that it wouldn't serve anybody's purposes to have uh, uh, changes in our revenue recognition without simultaneously dealing with uh, expense recognition as well, uh, in part to achieve parallel results in, in cases in which the transaction is between two governments. And also, you know, expense happens to be the area where uh, there's considerable uh, shortcomings, uh, if not total absence of guidance uh, in the accounting standards. The project is very broad, as I mentioned earlier, and it certainly covers a ton of day in and day out revenue and expense transactions, but it does exclude certain things um, uh, that require more specific guidance uh, that I think the board will be able to pursue once this basic comprehensive model is put in place. Uh, the first of those is capital asset and inventory related transactions. Um, the second is transa transactions related to financial instruments. Uh, and the third is transactions related to pensions and OPEB and other forms of post-employment benefits. The invitation to comment uh, identified a revenue and expense recognition model that has three components, classification, recognition, and measurement. Um, classification is when you determine what type of transaction you're looking at. Um, you know, and right now the key uh, classification issue is exchange versus non-exchange. That helps you to determine which recognition rules to apply. And recognition is the process of determining what elements, assets, liabilities, inflows, outflows, or resources should be reported in the financial statements and when they should be reported. Lastly, the third component, measurement, is determining how much you're going to recognize for that element. That part wasn't addressed in the invitation to comment, and it really isn't going to be addressed extensively. Uh, it, in a very rudimentary way, it will be dealt with in the preliminary views. Um, but the, the good news on measurement is that the board has a, um, uh, a, a conceptual framework, uh, a volume, the, the concept statement number six, uh, that uh, deals with measurement. So, uh, whatever the board ends up doing in this project is going to be within the confines of those concepts. So there's not as much that needs to be developed there in the way the classification and recognition are kind of open fields. The heart of the invitation to comment, or ITC, uh, was the exposure of three recognition models. Uh, the existing exchange, non-exchange, but with some enhancements in order to deal with some things like the absence of, ex, uh, of exchange transaction guidance for uh, expenses, uh, uh, an approach that uses the FASB's performance obligation, and then a hybrid uh, that uh, uses the categorization approach of exchange and non-exchange, uh, but uses uh, the recognition approach of performance obligation, no performance obligation. So the exchange, non-exchange model that we currently have, I, I probably don't need to go into this in any great detail, but um, at least what was laid out with the enhancements uh, was that you ask the question, is the transaction an exchange? And if it is, then you use an earning recognition approach. Uh, so if, if the government controls a resource or it incurs an obligation to sacrifice a resource and there is a change in net assets uh, that is not applicable to a future period, meaning it's applicable to the period uh, uh, that it uh, occurs in, uh, then you know, that's how you recognize, uh, uh, that's when you're going to recognize elements, assets or liabilities, inflows or outflows or resources. And if it's not an exchange, then essentially you would apply the existing standards in Statement 33, but ultimately, if this is the path that's taken, uh, 
you know, with some improvements that would help to address some of those uh, application issues that were identified both in the Foundation's uh, post-implementation review and in the GASB's own uh, pre-agenda research. So the performance obligation, uh, before you know, showing you what that approach looks like, it's worth just saying something uh, briefly about what a performance obligation is. Uh, what was in the ITC was very similar to what is in Topic 606 uh, of the FASB, and that is a performance obligation is a promise in a binding arrangement between a government and another party to provide distinct goods and services to a specific beneficiary. And you see I uh, have highlighted in green those key uh, items which the ITC then uh, went on to define uh, in, in, in some detail. A binding arrangement is legally enforceable. Uh, it's a mutual understanding between the government and the other party. Uh, which can be a customer, or a taxpayer, or a resource provider, or a vendor, an employee, uh, and so on. Um, distinct goods or services are separately identifiable, uh, and they can provide benefits on their own. Uh, and uh, a specific beneficiary is uh, someone or some entity uh, that is identifiable uh, and can be distinguished from uh, the public in general. Uh, so it's not all taxpayers, it's a specific taxpayer uh, if it's a tax transaction and that actually meets these criteria. Generally, it doesn't. Um, uh, spoiler alert. Uh, so you're talking about more like providing goods or services uh, to individual uh, citizens or customers uh, as you would, for instance, with a water utility or an electric utility. So with the performance obligation, no performance obligation model, uh, the classification question is, does the transaction contain a performance obligation? And if it does, then you follow the performance obligation recognition approach, where you uh, determine what the amount of consideration is. Uh, you allocate it to the performance obligations if there's more than one. If there's not, then no allocation is necessary. So this is sounding a lot like the, the five steps that the FASB laid out, right? Uh, and then you're recognizing revenue uh, or expense as each performance obligation is satisfied either at a point in time or uh, you know over a period uh, uh, and uh, you know assuming that the transaction is applicable to the reporting period and if it's not if it's applicable to a future period you're not going to recognize revenue or expense you're going to recognize a deferred inflow or a deferred outflow uh, and if the answer is no then uh, if there's no performance obligation on the transaction, then you would effectively apply the existing standards uh, for non-exchange transactions uh, under Statement 33. And that's all for right now. Um, uh, we will uh, pick this up again next week uh, with Part 2, uh, when the focus will be on what the board heard in response to the ITC, its re-deliberations in light of that feedback and uh, uh, the development of the preliminary views that is scheduled to be considered for issuance in June of 2020.